And now we have S. David Mitchell, the Ruth L. Holston Professor of Law and Director of the Michael A. Middleton Center for Race, Citizenship, and Justice. He earned a JD and PhD in Sociology from the University of Pennsylvania and a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology and Political Science at Brown University. At the University of Missouri School of Law, he teaches torts, law and society, and collateral consequences of sentencing. He is an interdisciplinary scholar whose research focuses on the collateral consequences that attach following a conviction, specifically the legal obstacles that prevent the formerly incarcerated from successfully reintegrating back into society. He has been recognized for his teaching and service as a recipient of the Minority Faculty and Staff Appreciation Award, the Spurgeon Smithson Award from the Missouri Bar Foundation, and the Diversity and Inclusion Award from Missouri Lawyers Media. And most recently, he was awarded the William T. Kimber Fellowship for Teaching Excellence. He is a regular teaching visitor at Douglas High School and is a member of the Minority Men's Network. He is a member of Missouri Advisory Committee to the United States Commission on Civil Rights. He has also served as a law clerk to the Honorable Andre M. Davis in the District County or Court of Maryland and was a scholar in residence in the Department of Sociology at the University of Colorado at Boulder. His spouse also teaches at the university, and he has two beautiful children. Please welcome David to our TEDx stage. Our community is like a rowboat. Now, I know what you're thinking. We are a community in a landlocked state, and I'm calling it a rowboat. Why? And I'm pretty sure my family is thinking, he doesn't know how to swim. Why is he calling it a rowboat? It makes no sense whatsoever. Well, to power a rowboat, you need oars. To power our community in the same direction to a common destination of an inclusive community, each of us must be an oar. Open to learning from others, authentic self-presentation, and respect and dignity for other people. Oh, open to learning from others. I'm a law professor. I walk into class and I teach students from different racial and ethnic backgrounds, different gender identities, different gender sexual orientations, religions, political ideologies, different parts of the state and of the country. Each comes with their own story their own narrative, their own lived experiences about what they have accomplished and what they have done. And of course, I'm no different. But I'm the professor in the room, right? So I should know more than my students. But if I were not open to learning from them, I would miss the knowledge that they would share from their lived experiences. So for example, when I was young, a young professor, young in my career, not in age, I stood in front of a classroom to talk about a case where a haystack caught on fire. Now, I'm an urban kid. Haystacks catching on fire? I have no idea what this means. And so I, as I stand in front of this class, I had students whose lived experience were in rural parts of the state who said to me, Professor, yes, if you don't properly ventilate a haystack, it can spontaneously combust. Blown away, right? But if I had not been open to learning from them, I would not have accepted that wisdom and that knowledge from their lived experience. I would have understood, in effect, what their past had taught them. Now, you may be thinking, it's easy to create an inclusive classroom community. You're the professor in the room, these are your students. But outside the community, outside the classroom, I'm a legal scholar. I do work primarily on the criminal justice reform system, collateral consequences of sentencing, and laws that impact the lives of those who return from incarceration, that impact and challenge their reentry and reintegration back into society. And because of the years of formal education, I'm often termed or labeled as an expert. But I'm not the expert in that circumstance. It's the men and women who've gone away and who come back. They are the experts. I read the cases, the statutes, but they have the lived experiences. And if I stood on the fact that they didn't have formal education, and let's be honest, many of them do, let's not hold our brothers and sisters who go away short. 
They come home, though, and they face a lived reality that is far different than something that I can read. But if I didn't accept, if I wasn't open to hearing from them, to acknowledging what they had experienced, I would not be learning from them. And my failure to be open to learning from them would undermine creating an inclusive community. And in that same vein, for us to create an inclusive community, not just, we must not just be open to learning from others, but we must allow them to engage in an authentic self-presentation. The A, authentic self-presentation. To foster an inclusive community, we have to allow and encourage one another to engage in an authentic self-presentation. Many of us have a curated public profile. France Fanon talks about this, black skin, white mask. W.E.B. Du Bois talks about this as a double consciousness. Common parlance, we talk about this as code switching, that we have to manicure our profile of who we are depending upon the audience that we're speaking to. That we hide our authentic self-presentation and by doing so, Folks don't see who we are or know who we are. And so then how can the community be inclusive if we have to hide our true selves, our self-presentation? But to share one's authentic self-presentation means that you have to be vulnerable. And you have to acknowledge and accept and hope that the people with, that you are sharing this self-presentation will accept it. So here's my vulnerability. I'm an African-American cisgender male born and raised and grew up in a large East Coast city. I was raised by a mother and a stepfather who left, who were raised in the Jim Crow South, who migrated north. I was raised in the African Methodist Episcopal tradition. Neither of my parents went to college, graduate school or professional school, but I did. I attended an all male private school and went on to graduate school, professional school. And in this moment, working with them, learning from them, I have now been able to sort of accomplish things that they could not. But if I am too passionate about what I believe in, if I am too loud, I'm labeled the angry black man. If I speak properly, wear a certain dress, I'm labeled a sellout, an Oreo, self-hating. And so it's important that I have to, that I'm allowed to engage in this authentic self-presentation because that in effect shows you who I am. It moves beyond the facade and gets to the real person behind it. One of my favorite quotes is by Marion Williamson. Um, you might remember from the Coach Carter movie at the end, but it's, the quote is, our deepest fears is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fears is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that we are most afraid of. We ask ourselves, well, who are we to be brilliant, gorgeous, generous, talented? Well, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened by shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We are born in God's glory. The idea here is that we are, if we allow ourselves to engage in this way, to show who we truly are, we allow others to see us for ourselves, and therefore we are an inclusive community. If we don't, then we don't accept individuals for who they are at that moment in time. But it's more than just allowing someone to have an authentic self-presentation. We also have to have the R, respect and treat others with dignity. Now, you all know as well as I do that the Queen of Souls said it best, Aretha, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, right? Find out what it means to me. <clears throat> I know my singing voice isn't all that great. And yet, we all know what common respect looks like. The idea is that we treat each other with dignity regardless of who they are. Unemployed, unhoused, employed, housed, formerly incarcerated or not, college graduate or not. Without that respect, we create a divide between people in our community, those who we identify as deserving of our compassion, our empathy, our understanding. We create implicit categories of those that we deem to be worthy and unworthy. 
Respect allows us to cross that barrier, to see that individual for their humanity and to acknowledge them for who they are. My stepfather would deliver mail in this large East Coast city. We would often see individuals who suffered from substance abuse addiction, individuals who were unhoused, individuals who were unemployed, but he also saw individuals who were veterans like himself, individuals who were college educated, individuals who had dreams, but he treated everyone he came into contact with with respect and dignity, for it was their humanity that he saw, not what their identity, not how they identified themselves or the external pieces that sort of identified or labeled their lives and that we have labeled their lives. And so, in order for our community to foster an inclusive community, in order for us to continue to move in the direction of that common destination, each of us must be an oar. I am an oar. Will you be one as well?